come to this fourth Sunday of Lent here at Heritage United Church. You know, in some ways, this is a rather significant Sunday. For one year ago, this weekend, we were no longer worshiping together in this space. I can't believe it has been a year since that started, but I'd like to believe that as we worship this morning, that we will find moments of joy, moments of hope as we proceed forward in this year of 2021, and that we will find glimpses of solutions to what is happening and to know that whether it be virtually or all together at one time in this space, that we are together, that God is with us, that we are not alone. Thanks be to God. And so we gather from our homes, from our living rooms, from our kitchens, from our bedrooms, hopefully soon from our back porch, and we come to find out what's going on here at Heritage United Church. Well, we've kept busy, that is for sure. Lent is no different this year, maybe even more busy. I find I'm always looking for new ideas, and so I hope that you've been checking your email lists each week to see what uh, things have come in. Mondays are uh, prayers. Tuesdays are uh, a quiz this past week. I've had uh, some fun facts and other things will be coming in each week. Uh, included with the newsletter this week is actually a recipe for making uh, pretzels, which was uh, something that has to do with Lent because of the way that pretzels are formed in the form of a, of a, of a prayer or a and so I invite you to make pretzels if you can and send in a picture of them. Wednesdays have continued to be our the reflection and I've been reflecting on the psalm of the week. I hope that you've been able to join me as I do reflect and maybe leaves you reflecting yourself on some things that are drawn from the psalm into your own life. Thursdays have been uh, the other study that I decided to take on, which is give up something bad for Lent. And I'm not talking about chocolate, or although if you want to give up chocolate or coffee or something else, please feel free to go ahead. Uh, this has given us an opportunity to reflect on things like giving up anger and envy and, and jealousy. I hope that you had a chance to have a look at those that have come out on Thursdays. And Thursdays have also been my poem day, a poem for Lent. And then I end off the week with a Friday funny, yes, we've got to go out the week with something to smile about. Of course, we've continued on with our Zoom, and I've made a point of including in uh, more coordinates, links on how to get in there for you. For those of you that have not had a chance to or who have forgotten and not joined us for a little while, please join us. Wednesdays at 11.30 till noon and Sundays from 11 to 11.30. And for those of you that are interested in participating, we've also been doing a Lenten study group. No reading required beforehand, no prior knowledge, just come as you are. Join us by phone or by video on Sundays at 11.30 and we've been meeting for 45 minutes to an hour and that will continue through till Palm Sunday. Those are some of the things that are happening here at Heritage United Church. We will continue to find the means to engage with one another creatively as this coming year unfolds. And so that is the life and work of our church. And at this time, we are called to join together for our call to worship. All week, it's been give and take. Give all that we've got and take whatever is handed to us. So for the next little while, we are called to slow down and simply be. So many times it just seems like bumper to bumper traffic. Stuck in a lane, no view, no feeling of control. So for the next little while, we're invited to follow a different path. We are called by the voice of the one who loves us deeply. So often we feel alone, like we are the only ones going this way. So this morning, we are called to hold hands, even if it's virtually. To walk together a new road, a road that leads home. This morning you are called to worship God, so together let us worship. Today is the fourth Sunday of the season of Lent. 
And as a community of faith, we have been traveling with Jesus through story, through song and prayer on his final journey to Jerusalem. And in this way, and in our own personal experiences of faith, we have witnessed God's profound love made known to the world and the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. In Jesus, God's love lights the way for those who choose to follow. And as we extinguish the fourth candle, we lament the ways in which we sometimes lose sight of the light of Christ and harden our hearts to the needs of others. As we watch the smoke rise, we remember that God's Spirit is with us in mysterious and visible ways, and that we are forgiven, blessed, and encouraged to open our hearts and our lives to God. Let us raise our voices in song, a prayer to you, O God, with our musical response. Loving God, we come into your presence so aware of our human frailty and yet overwhelmed by your love for us. We thank you that there is no human experience that we might walk through where your love cannot reach us. If we climb the highest mountain, you are there. And yet if we find ourselves in the darkest valley, you are there. Help us to rest in that love that asks nothing more than the simple trusting heart of a child. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Let us join our voices now as we share together in our opening hymn, God is Here. Let us sing.
Yes, it's always a pleasure to, to know that you are sitting out there watching us over here and joining me here on the chancel steps with my friends, with Mrs. Bonnet and, and Peepers the Chick. Peepers the Chick, you're just about time for Easter coming. Of course, I've got Faircrow and Chimp and Taz. I've got our new friend here, our love bunny here, a love angel bunny, a beautiful garden ornament that uh, was shared with us this, just recently, a, a great reminder of the season we are heading into. Of course, I've got Betty Boop and Moose keeping an eye on things at the back. I've got, oh, Jim, our love bear. Jim, I'm talking a lot about love this morning, and what a great reminder having you right there in the middle with your beautiful heart. I've got our guardian angel bear that normally sits on my old bed at my parents' home. I've got our fire truck, a continued reminder of our first responders. I've got Suzanne and Dad and Sally and Danny, their best friends there. And of course, I've got Sweater Bear. Sweater Bear, hopefully we won't need those sweaters too much longer. And I do have hiding. Oh, there you are. And I've got Summer Bear hiding in the back with a coat and hat and scarf. You know what, Sweater Bear? I think we are almost there. You're going to have to change back into summer clothes. And of course, yes, I have got Joe. And I've got my friend Lucinda, who have come to join us as well. They always like to have a moment with all of you. And I can get Lucinda organized here. What's that? Yeah, there is. You want to see? She wanted to see how many people were up there. I know it's kind of hard to see, but just imagine that all of your friends at home are watching to see what we've got to talk. Yes, they want to find out what I brought too. Yes, Joe. Yeah, I did. I brought something to show you guys today. I, yeah, I did mention we're talking about love. Did you want to find out? Okay. All right. So let me put you down. This morning, I brought with me a picture because I don't have a real one anymore. I think I did when Andrew was in public school, but well, he's a long ways past that now. I brought a picture of a, that's right, a globe. See all my friends? I bought a picture of a globe. Now, to start with, what I want you to do first, yes? all of you at home, I want you to give yourselves, and all of my friends who here the best they can, give yourself a really big hug. 
Okay, nice big hug. That's right. Now, I want you to virtually reach out to the globe. That's right. Reach out to the globe as if you're touching the globe. Okay? God so loved the world. God reaches out to all the people, the children and the adults, all around the world, no matter whether you live in Canada or Africa or South America or China or the Philippines, or I don't have, my geography is not perfect, but all the different countries, big and small, God reaches out like a really big hug to everyone around the world. For God so loved the world and all the people in it. And that is our story for today. A reminder that God loves you. God loves me. God loves my friends here. God loves your friends. And God loves all the friends and people around the world. What a great reminder on this Sunday that God so loved the world. At this time, we take a moment as we bring our offerings before God. This is an opportunity to think of how we can give back, how we can use the abilities we have to reach out to one another. My goodness, we have found creative ways, haven't we, this year? Encouraging those of you who have little to no experience on the computer to join a Zoom group or to virtually put together a mistletoe market because, well, we've got crafty people here. And so a few of us were here with masks on, ready to deliver them to the window of a car. We've offered back by dropping off care packages. We have offered back by providing the kids with a little something at Christmas time in lieu of the crafts they would have done here at church during Sunday school time. We've offered back by driving up to a home and saying hello from a distance. We've given back by phoning each other by sending cards, by being available through email and chat. So many ways we have given back. And then beyond all that, we've embraced new ways of financially supporting our church over this past year, haven't we? E-transfers, who would have ever thought? But many of you have embraced that way of giving so that to make sure that your church continues to thrive. More of you have gone on par. More of you have dropped off your offerings at Carol D's home. And many of you have continued to provide the envelopes that you always used on Sunday mornings to let the church know that you continue to support all that it does. And so at this time, our giving this morning expresses our firm conviction that God is with us no matter what. And so let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude, heartfelt commitment, and praise as our offering is received.
And now let us dedicate our offering. Let us pray. Holy One, Creator God, we graciously offer what we are able. We place here our resources, our work, our hopes for this church, our dreams for this world. May your light shine upon these gifts and upon all of us who offer them, empowering us to be wise and generous and open to new understandings. Amen. And now let us continue in prayer as we bring our prayers for our world, our community, our family and friends before God. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, on this one year anniversary of not being able to gather together in worship because of the pandemic, we turn to you in prayer. When we continue to feel unsure, God, help us to be calm. When information comes, help us to discern. When fear and anxiety seem to be the order of the day, slow us down, God. Help us to reach out with our hearts when we can't touch with our hands. Help us to continually find ways of being socially connected when we have to be socially distant. On this one year anniversary, we take some time to remember the lives lost and the loved ones who mourn. We remember the pain of separation, the sadness of opportunities missed and celebrations canceled. We remember the job losses and economic toll the stress and despair of people who were unemployed or own a struggling business. We recall stay-at-home orders and lockdowns, and we pray for those without a home during this pandemic, as well as those for whom home is a place of turmoil. We hold in prayer those who especially are feeling isolated or afraid, parents feeling overwhelmed or anxious, young people lonely or frustrated. This morning, we bring before you those who weigh heaviest on our minds this day, as we pray for Alma and Bob Watt, John Seagraft, Bob and Marilyn Palmer, Barb Garland, Joyce Lapp, Ellie Jones, Maureen and Harry Terhune, and Lee Kirby. We also take a moment to bring our own personal concerns to you, O oh God, in this moment of silence. Even in the midst of loss, pain, and grief, O oh God, we give you thanks for signs of hope and resilience, for the promise of vaccines and the medical expertise that created them, for the compassion and extraordinary sacrifices of healthcare workers, for the courage and dedication of essential service providers, for the ways in which ordinary people are making sacrifices for the good of their neighbor. Loving God, Bless and protect us as we enter the second year of this pandemic. Inspire us as a spirit of compassion and generosity. Empower us to learn from this experience and agitate for change. We ask in the name of our healer and hope, Jesus, who also gave us words to pray together as a constant sign of his presence with us no matter what. Let us pray together those words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now let us take some time as we hear God's word with a reading from the Psalms by Evelyn Lilly. 
Good morning. I'm reading this morning from Psalm 107, verses 1 to 3 and verses 17 to 22. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the Redeemer, redeemed of the Lord, say this. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe. Those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. Verse 17. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent forth his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. This ends the reading. <laughs> chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth 
comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. God bless these readings from our scriptures this morning. Amen. And at this time, let us join our voices as we sing together, Jesus Bids Us Shine. Let us sing. preparation. We'd be anticipating the celebration of Jesus' birth in less than a week. That's right, Christmas Eve would be just around the corner. But this is an Advent. It's Lent. And we have a ways to go before the end of this 40-day journey into the wilderness. There are still two more weeks before we can wave palm branches at the entry into Holy Week. We have three more weeks to pray and prepare our hearts for Christ's resurrection on Easter morning. And to top it all off, here in the middle of Lent is the first Sunday one year ago today that we were unable to worship together. We would have, who would have ever thought that we would be still apart? So I thought we needed a little bit of joy. I read that centuries ago, someone thought it would be a good idea to make the fourth Sunday of Lent a Sunday when we get to rejoice in the Lord. So I start with a funny story for us today that I hope helps to get that joy flowing. This is a little known story about how God created animals and humans. On the first day, God created the dog and said, Sit all day by the door of your house and bark at anyone who walks past. For this, I will give you a lifespan of 20 years. That's a long time to be barking, said the dog. How about only 10 years and I'll give you back the other 10. So God agreed. On the second day, God created the monkey and said, Entertain people, do tricks and make them laugh. For this, I'll give you 20 year lifespan. Monkey tricks for 20 years, asked the chip. That's a pretty long time to perform. How about I give you back 10 like the dog did? God agreed. On the third day, God created the cow and said, 
You must go out into the field with the farmer all day long and stand under the sun, have calves and give milk to support the farmer's family. For this, I will give you a lifespan of 70 years. Whoa, said the cow. That's kind of a tough life you want me to live for 70 years. How about I give you back 20? How about, I, about 20 and I'll give you back 50? And God agreed again. On the fourth day, God created the human and said, Eat, sleep, pray, marry, and enjoy your life. For this, I'll give you 20 years. Only 20 years, wailed the human? Could you possibly give me the 20, the 50 the cow back gave back, the 10 the monkey gave back, and the 10 from the dog? That makes 90. Deal? Okay, God sighed. <sighs> you asked for it. So that is why for the first 20 years, we eat, sleep, pray, play, and enjoy ourselves. For the next 50 years, we have children and we slave to support them. For the next 10 years, we do monkey tricks to entertain our grandchildren. And for the last 10 years, we sit on the front porch and bark at everyone who walks by. Life has now been explained to you. God so loved the world. I can't think of a better gospel passage to bring us joy than this third chapter from John's gospel. This is where we find the famous verse that sums up the whole gospel message. For God so loved the world. God sent Jesus to be a missionary to the world. His ministry was to go on a multicultural journey to tell people about the kingdom of God. He left his home and family and traveled a long way. He learned the language of the people he met, ate their food, taught and healed them, and was a living example of God's love in action. God so loved the world. Sometimes I really think that ours is a world that only God could love. Each week we hear stories of where things currently are with this pandemic. It has been alarming and unsettling to say the least. So much information is out there if you want to hear about it. But the one thing that we all know is that our world has been radically changed and will never be the same. So I decided I was going to look for some good news stories this past week. And you know what? I actually found some. There was one of a story of, a, of butterflies being released at an Ontario's nursing home, which gave hope for the seniors who lived there. There was another story about a Canadian dancing baby who just couldn't stop bouncing in her jolly jumper. Remember those? The little girl has brought so much joy in so many ways. Just two examples of simple things that bring us happiness, hope, and love. For God so loved the world. Loved, lived. And this brings us to the story of Nicodemus a Pharisee and a rabbi who comes to Jesus under the cover of darkness in the verses just before the ones we heard read today. Maybe Rabbi Nick comes to Jesus at night to keep his conversation a secret from the other Pharisees. Maybe he doesn't want to admit publicly that he is in contact with Jesus, that he wants to learn from him. Or maybe he was only trying to speak with Jesus without being interrupted after the crowds have left for the day. Whatever motivation caused him to wait until darkness had fallen, his appearance at night is unusual enough that, that later, when Nicodemus re-enters the story, he is referred to as the one who came 
to Jesus at night. It's pretty clear that Nicodemus comes to Jesus in a state of confusion and spiritual blindness, and he can't seem to grasp what Jesus is trying to teach him. We know this because Jesus can't believe that a biblical scholar and teacher can't grasp the truth that is standing right there in front of him, as he tells him that plainly. Whether he's being stubborn or simply misguided in his lack of understanding, well, Nicodemus is completely in the dark, as it were, when it comes to comprehending how God actually thinks and works in the world. It's also clear that Nicodemus has been keeping an eye on Jesus. He has seen him teaching in the synagogues and he recognizes that Jesus teaches with an authority he himself would never dare to claim. So Nicodemus approaches Jesus seeking, wanting to find out more about him and his message. Jesus uses an image of new birth, which Nicodemus doesn't get. Jesus, of course, is speaking about a, a spiritual rebirth, but Nicodemus is thinking only of a physical birth. How can anyone be born after growing up? Can they go back into their mother's womb? Clearly, Nicodemus is very frustrated and more confused than ever. Jesus simply is not making any sense to him at all. Finally, Jesus turns to a strange Old Testament passage to make his point. In the days of their wilderness wanderings, Israel had sinned. Actually, they did this over and over and over again. They were grumbling about Moses, grumbling about God, and there was, this, there was punishment. The punishment was, in part, to be bitten by snakes. The Israelites cried out to God for deliverance, and God used this strange thing to save them. Moses formed a bronze serpent, mounted it on a pole, and hoisted it towards the sky. When the people looked up to it, they were healed. Strange, but it is a story that Nicodemus remembered. In the same way, Jesus then tells Nicodemus, people will one day look to the cross and live. Just as Moses lifted up the servant into the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Look to the cross for healing. That was Jesus' advice to Nicodemus, as understood by the early church. In those moments when fear seems to get the better of us, when the light at the end of the tunnel is like an oncoming train, when the only luck we seem to have is bad luck, when we are snake bitten, look to the cross. That is where our hope lies when we are discouraged, when we are down and nearly out, when there, were, when there is nowhere else to turn. Because at the cross, where we encounter love in its purest form, the story of Nicodemus does not end in the, with an illusion of the serpent in the wilderness. It was in the hurting Nicodemus that Jesus spoke these words from John's Gospel, that we all know so well and love so much. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever, everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world. You know, to some, Jesus failed in his ministry and missionary endeavors and was crucified for his trouble. So much for God's love.
But in God's eyes and in those of his believers then and now, Jesus' mission was a glorious accomplishment. He saved a world that only God could love. God reached out to people with love who turned away time and time again. A love so amazing, so divine, so deep that it demands our soul, our life, our all. God so loved the world, but can we? Can we love the world as God loves it? I'm not talking about the world of our imagination, not the world of our longing, but the world that is. The world, it seems, that only God can love. The world with all its beauty and ugliness, its grace and grime. God so loved the world. Jesus was trying to impress on Nicodemus the extravagance, beauty of God's grace. He was trying to tell him that God's devotion to his creation beyond measure and certainty, beyond our understanding. Our text ends without any sense that Nicodemus really got it, really comprehended the good news of God's never-ending love for the world. But later in the gospel, Nicodemus appears again, this time to care for the body of Jesus after the crucifixion. He comes again, bringing a generous mixture of myrrh and aloes to anoint his body bearing the marks of the cross. I believe he did this out of a deep and abiding love for the young preacher from Nazareth, who just could have been the son of God. Of course, he had no way to fix what had happened, but the power of the story is that he was simply a man who came to offer a symbol of his love. The confused Nicodemus, who once came at night, finally understands that. God so loved the world. This is love in its purest form. And we are called to love what God loves, who God loves, and as God loves. Our prayers and our goals over this last year echo the words of Julian Norwich from the Middle Ages who said that all may be well. Together, we have done our best to live this kind of love throughout this past year in many creative ways. And so I want to share with you some of the pictures that were shared with me of family and friends who found ways of creatively living love this past year. Sit back and enjoy.
You see, we share the power of healing. Love in its purest form. It's beyond our comprehension, but it's freely given. So as God carries each of us, let us continue to live love every day. May it be so. Let us pray. God of all loving compassion, love us, keep us, hold on to us in all things, even and especially during this time in our lives that we continue to journey forward. Help us always remember that you are with us. We are never alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now let us join our voices for a beautiful closing hymn this morning. What wondrous love is this? Let us sing together. make us caring companions as together we go forward in this Lenten time. Amen and Amen.